All right, good morning. I think it's time to start. Uh, on Tuesday, we introduced the general form of tau in terms of vector equation representing tau in all directions. One single equation, one tensor equation, okay? And at the end of the class, we also introduced another term, rho vv, and which are different. Tau is a molecular transport. It's a transport of momentum from one area to the area next to it, okay? It is like transferring of energy by means of conduction. It means it does not rely on the flow, okay? On the other hand, rho vv is a convective transport of mo molecular of momentum. It is transported by means of the flow. It is a little bit difficult to understand because in order to get momentum, you need a flow, right? In order to, to gain momentum, you need velocity. So there is no way to have momentum without velocity. But in the term of the transport of the momentum itself, tau means you have momentum, you put momentum to the guy next to it, okay? But rho vv, that means you push the whole system, push momentum toward the others. By, it doesn't matter whether the, the transfer will be next to each other. That's the difference. The point is, both of them are tensor. Okay, this one is a tensor. We have two lines underneath. It is tensor already. This one, on the other hand, you have two vectors together. It is also tensor. Okay? So at the end of the class on Tuesday, we introduced these two. And we said when you combine these two together, it will be what we call combined flux. Each term is a flux. That means it is momentum transport per unit area per unit time. Okay? So for today, we will put this together and try to come up with an equation which is called a equation of balance just like energy or mass balance that you are familiar with since last year, all right? Now, before we go into the balance, let us go back to what we discussed on Tuesday. Um, both of them are tensor, and when I introduced rho vv, I gave this one as an example. Rho vx together, this is x momentum per unit volume, Okay, multiply by distance per time, then you get momentum flux. So if you look at this one in the parentheses, rho vx represents x momentum. So the first direction of the tensor is supposed to go in x direction. When you multiply by vy, the whole term turns to be the flux. That means there will be direction of the transfer involved. You're introducing the second direction. Second direction will be represented by double arrows. In this one, the second direction or the transfer direction is in y direction. So you can write down second arrow going in y direction like so. So the whole thing, the mass, the momentum transfer flux can be represented by two directions. Okay, Vx, Vy. On the other hand, tau can be split into nine components. One component is tau xy. I told you that the second subscript dictates the direction of the flow. Whenever you have the second subscript to be y like this, that means you have Vy. So this tau responds to momentum in y direction, right? So I think I wrote it wrong. For this one, the first direction or the direction of momentum should go in y direction. This direction is a direction of the transfer. So you have second direction going in x direction like this, OK? So it is a little bit confusing because, um, you know, when you have x first for tau, 
this is the transfer direction. But x, the first x in row VV, that's uh, another transfer direction. Oh, this x is momentum direction. Okay? So it is a little bit different. Now, if I write down tau yx, now it will be x momentum transferring in y direction, right? X momentum transferring in y direction, direction of momentum, direction of the transfer, OK? Let's just forget about this for the moment. If I consider the whole box as my system, whenever I have momentum transfer into it, the whole box is supposed to have an increase in momentum, just like in, in, in mass. Suppose you have a box, a system, and you have mass transfer into the system. Okay, so suppose I have something transferring mass from outside to inside. The mass within the system should increase, right? At the same time, if I have mass going out, you know, the mass within the system should decrease. If the flow of mass going in and going out are equal, then there will be no accumulation of mass inside. We call this situation to be a steady state. And the re representation of the equation should be something like this. Rate of mass going in subtracted by rate of mass going out, plus if you generate some mass inside the box, you add them up, equal to zero at steady state. You learned that from last class, last couple class. And you should be familiar with this equation by now. If you turn into equation of energy, that would be exactly the same except that you change the word mass here to energy. Energy in subtracted by energy out plus other kind of energy transfer like heat or work should equal to zero. That's first law of thermodynamics. Okay? The key word is rate. The equation of mass balance usually represents everything in terms of rate. The unit of this rate, if it is for mass, is supposed to be kilogram per second. Okay? So that means if I want to calculate the balance equation for my system, I need to know how fast the mass is transferred into the system. Okay? Same thing. If I want to write down equation for momentum balance, now my momentum here receive momentum, uh, my system here receive momentum. Right now, momentum is transferred into system into y direction. And therefore, the whole system is supposed to have an increase in momentum. OK? In this picture, you should see that there are two ways to transfer momentum into my system by means of convective transport and by means of molecular transport, okay? Both of them transfer momentum into the system. The, on, the other difference is this guy transfer X momentum inside. This guy transfer Y moment, uh, I'm sorry, this is also X momentum going inside, right? Okay? Now, if I try to come up with a similar equation, these two are flux. That means it is momentum 
per unit time or per unit area per unit time. If I want the equation of balance, I need momentum per time or momentum rate, just like equation of mass balance. Okay? So, for momentum balance, they're supposed to have rate of momentum in subtracted by rate of momentum out, just like in mass balance. If you look at the unit, the unit is supposed to be momentum per time. If we write momentum per time, that's supposed to be momentum is mv. Okay? So the unit is supposed to be kilogram meter per second. That's momentum per unit of time. Right? So at the end, you should get kilogram meter per second square as a unit of momentum rate. So this equation is supposed to have unit of kilogram meter per second square. And if you look closely, this unit is the same as kilogram times meter per second square. This is acceleration, right? Acceleration times mass. That's force. So this is basically Newton. Newton is force. So that means momentum per time and force are somehow in the same family. They're in the same family. Okay? So back to our equation, if you look for momentum transfer or momentum going in and out of the system with respect to time, I can have momentum transfer in by tau. I can have momentum going in by rho VV, either way, right? So this can be by tau, or let's, let's say by molecular transport, or by convective transport. Same thing for going out. The system receives momentum by two means. It can also give up momentum by two means. Okay? So the out term can be split into molecular transport and convective transport as well. So molecular transport and convective transport. Okay? Now, the third term for mass, you can generate mass if you look at component mass balance, like you have A and B, and A is consumed or generated by reaction. The generation term by means of reaction will be included. If you look at overall mass balance, this term will be zero because we cannot create mass, right? Okay? If you consider component balance, this term is generation rate, how fast your molecules or how fast your species is generated by means of reaction. You just add this term up. In terms of momentum, can we create momentum? I stand still, I have no momentum. How can I get momentum? First way is someone push me. 
or someone hits me. I just stand here and a car may hit me. There will be momentum transfer from a car to myself, right? That's these two terms. Or someone can just push me on the back, just stand next to me and use a force to push me. Or I can walk myself. If I walk, my foot have performed some kind of force to the floor, right? So in order to create momentum, basically I have, I need force. And if you consider this, rate of momentum and force are correlated. So that means the generation term here, momentum can be generated by force. This term is related to force. Okay? So somehow we need force in this generation term. Because we know that if you apply force, you gain momentum. So by means of giving force, you can create momentum within your system. So this term must somehow contain force. But in order to put this into the equation, the unit of this in and out term and the unit of the force term must be consistent. Okay? What is unit of the in and out term? This one, which is Newton, which is the same as unit of force. So basically, this generation term for the momentum is essentially force itself. Okay? So you just add force here as a means to generate momentum equal to zero at steady state. Of course, if the force is given to the system, my system gains momentum. If the system acts the force or do the force to other, the system loses momentum. So this term is a net generation. Just like in the mass, your reactants, your, your species, may be both reactant and product at the same time. The reaction going, I mean, the reaction consuming your species decreased concentration of your species within the system. At the same time, if your species is also generated by reaction, there will be generation term as well. So this term is the net generation. Just like this. Understand? Okay? In terms of force of the fluid, there are two kinds of force. The first kind is related to pressure. Because imagine I have if I stand in a sea, okay, if the sea level is around my chest, if I put my hand inside, I should experience some pressure. The deeper I put, the higher the pressure, right? So that means different position in the fluid give different pressure. You learned that already. But different pressure give different force to my system. So if you have the box of my system, put the box shallowly on the water, the pressure exerted on each face is supposed to be small. If I put this box down deeper in the water, pressure experienced on each face is supposed to be increased. Right? So that means the pressure exerted on the, on the system gives you a force. Pressure that gives you a force depends on position. Understand? So we need the term pressure. Okay? The other term is external force. 
are the kind of force that can be applied to fluid. For instance, gravity force. You have fluid in the tank. You open up the bottom of the tank, the fluid flows down by means of gravity. So this gravity makes the fluid flow, right? If you have the, a bucket of water above your head, and somehow you punch a hole at the bottom of the bucket, liquid flows down by means of gravity. Initially, liquid has no momentum, it stays in the bucket. You just punch the hole, and then liquid starts flowing. That's because external force of the gravity is exerting on the fluid at all time. So you need this term as well. Okay. Now, and we know that we already setting up that all terms have the same unit of Newton. So that's why if you're mechanical engineering, this equation is basically derived from force balance. It's a force from external force and force from fluid. In mechanical engineering, force from fluid is called viscous force. But in our case, it would be easier to explain in terms of whatever going in and whatever going out. That, that's why we call this one momentum balance. Okay? Now, whatever comes in, comes out, needs pressure as well. So if I take pressure combined with these two and split the force to another term, okay? Because pressure is acting on all phases of my system. So I can say that I have pressure on all sides, as well as the transfer of momentum in through all sides. Okay? So if I add tau rho VV together, that's combined flux. I can add pressure term in here as well. Add another pressure. But the unit of tau and unit of pressure are not the same, okay? No, I'm sorry. Uh, this, is, this is force, okay? Rate, per, rate of momentum per time, that's unit of force. For tau, that's force per unit area, okay? So the pressure, which is also force per unit area, should have the same unit as tau. The only thing different is that tau is tensor. Tau has directions. Pressure is scalar. Pressure does not have direction. In order to make pressure consistent with this equation, I need this. What is this? It's Kronecker delta. It has the size of one whenever the subscript is the same. Because pressure acts on the surface only in perpendicular direction, right? There's no shear pressure. So if you translate pressure into force respond to that pressure of, of force correlating to that pressure, you will only have force in the normal direction not in shear direction. That's why we need this delta multiplied by pressure. We only have pressure in x, x, y, y, z, z direction. The combination here is called combined flux of phi. Okay? So we can have phi going in, phi going out, and add external force, which is exclusively gravity. Pressure is already added to that part. This equation 
is momentum balance. Any question? We need a couple minutes just to make sure that you understand. Okay? So write it down. Have a couple minutes to write it down, everything. Any question? Understand? Can you keep up on this? Because from this moment on until our midterm, the rest will be example. Okay? The rest is calculation. The concept ends here. So once we set up equation for balance, the rest is how to show you how to use that equation. So I will start with very simple example. Example is you have inclined plane like a rooftop, and then there's a water pouring down as a film. So if there's a liquid water flowing and overflow down this kind of inclined roof, if the angle here is beta, your water will flow down here. Okay? What we want is basically study inside this film and see distribution of velocity within the film. First question for you, do you think here and there between dot and x, velocity are the same? No, obviously they're not the same the flow rate are not the same, or the, the linear velocity are not the same. Agree? All right. Now, whenever you do the examples or the problems, you have to look at the system and then choose proper coordinate. There's only three kinds of coordinate rectangular, cylindrical, spherical, okay? The coordinate suitable for the problem supposed to look like the problem. If your problem looks like cylindrical, you pick cylindrical coordinate. If it looks like spherical, you pick spherical coordinate. This problem is rectangular, okay? So we pick rectangular coordinate. Rectangular coordinate is x, y, and z. Then you pick up origin point, and it would be easier to choose one axis going in the direction of the flow. So the flow is going down here. That means one direction or one axis of your coordinate is supposed to go down like this. Okay. 
So origin point is arbitrary. That means you can choose when, wherever you want. You can choose here, you can choose there, anywhere. Doesn't matter. You always get the same answer. But it would be easier if you pick one axis along the flow. So the flow is going this direction. My first axis should go this direction. Okay. In the text, it is called z-axis. Another axis supposed to be perpendicular to z-axis. This is x-axis. The third axis going perpendicular to both, so y-axis going from the screen. Okay? Or going into the screen, according to your right-hand rules. Understand? Next step, or oh, by the way, if I say that the thickness of the film is delta, all right? In real life, when you flow water in, water going down, they're supposed to have some kind of turbulent at the entrance, also some turbulent at the end. At this stage of the course, we will look at laminar flow only. Okay? So our system is supposed to go somewhere in the middle from here. This has disturbance that we do not want. This also has some kind of disturbance. So let us focus on the area with the length L within the system. And let us move the axis to here at the starting point of your system. So at this point, it is z equal to 0. At this point, z is equal to l. OK? At this point, x is equal to 0. At this point, x is equal to delta. So now we narrow down the real system to what we want to calculate. OK? The next step that you will always need is to analyze velocity component. Since there's a flow, there will always be velocity. And velocity can be written in three components, Vx, Vy, and Vz, according to rectangular coordinate. Okay? Your job, and this is the critical point, you have to be able to do it, is to somehow visualize and answer which component is zero. Now ask yourself, do we have flow in x direction? If you cannot, ask another question, which direction do we have flow? Z, right? Now we have direct uh, flow in z direction for sure. That means vz is not zero right now. Do we have velocity in y direction? When you try to pour liquid down here, do we have direction in this direction? Now you have to think three-dimensionally. 
if this is my inclined plane, I pour liquid down, and liquid somehow going this way, downward, to form thin film. OK? What will it look like if I have velocity in y direction? If it goes down here, it's going in z direction, right? This is z direction. This is x direction. Let's say, oh, this is supposed to be y direction, right? No. X. This is Y. OK? If the water going as a flat plate, imagine you have some kind of tracer, like a piece of plastic. Put it down there. Try to visualize where it goes. If it goes straight down z direction, it means it has only z velocity component. If it somehow goes down this way, that means it has velocity component in y direction as well, right? If it goes down here, then it has velocity in x component as well. So you need visualization a bit. Okay, so as I said, this step is very, very important. Now, in real life, if you pour a liquid down to the flat plane like this, what you will have would be something like this. And water goes down like this. Have you seen that? It goes something like this. Oh, let us expand. OK? The width, if I say the width here is W, the width of the liquid film somehow tends to be smaller and smaller. In real life, you should realize velocity here going in z direction and velocity over there should not be the same because the flow is under gravity. So whenever you have gravity, you always have acceleration equal to g, right? So you drop something, that object would fall down with gravity, so it will accelerate. Water as well. When you pour that water, water travels faster and faster according to gravity or according to acceleration g. If water down here flow faster than water up here, the only way to keep water continuous is to reduce the area, right? Thing like this, if, you know, have you heard about black hole? Black hole which has very large gravity force, okay? If you jump into the black hole, because gravity force of the black hole is so large, your head, if you jump head down, your head would travel with higher velocity than your feet, like this. You're going down. If this part of your body travels with higher velocity, let's say higher velocity than your feet, what will happen to your body? your body would get snapped, right? Imagine your, your head travels somehow with different velocity than your feet. 
if it's go faster than your feet, your head would go further. Your feet cannot catch up. That means somehow you're losing your head, right? Now imagine fluid. If this is liquid, if this part of the liquid travels faster than this part, what will happen? Either you get the same thing, same situation here, this part of the liquid is separated from the rest. Have you seen waterfall? When waterfall is very high, like if you stand on the cliff and waterfall goes down like this, if the waterfall is so high, what happens to the bottom of the waterfall? It's a spray of liquid. It's a droplet of liquid. Have you seen that? At the top of the waterfall, waters flow in as a sheet. At the end, at the bottom, instead of going like continuous sheet down, it would go like this. And then you have a lot of splash. Have you seen that? Why do we have a lot of splash? Because water around here experience acceleration. Velocity of these droplets is higher than velocity here. And it cannot keep it constant anymore. So that's why it's split. Split into several droplets. Understand? OK? And we do not want that kind of complication. So in our system, we will say that our system would be defined just the small region, small enough that we can neglect acceleration. OK? Again, let me explain it again. With acceleration, the velocity down here should be much higher than velocity up here. And this part of the fluid cannot keep the fluid continuous anymore. That's why they split into several droplets. They travel faster. OK? Now, before changing from here down there, what usually happens is that the flow of water will somehow narrow down. Why narrows down? Because velocity here is larger than velocity there. In order to keep it continuous, you need to lower the cross-section area. Right? If you lower, if, if the cross-section area here is smaller, then linear velocity can be higher while keeping mass flow rate constant. Because mass flow rate is equal to linear velocity times cross-section area times density. That's mass flow rate. If we assume density of water at different points are constant, OK, up here and down there, rho would be the same. But linear velocity are not the same. Let's say we have v1 here and v2 over there. In order to keep the constant mass flow rate, it is unavoidable that the area here and area there, A1 and A2, cannot be the same to keep the same mass flow rate. OK? That's why A2 is much smaller because V2 is much larger than V1. So the water somehow narrowed down until it is too fast to keep it continuous anymore, it's split. OK? Now in this case, same thing happens. If you look at this point down here, then if you imagine putting some plastic pieces down here, you should see that it moves somehow in this direction, which can be 
split into VZ and VY, right? So it's a little bit complicated, so we do not want that at this stage. So we will consider only this part where velocity is still going in one direction only. Velocity is still uniform. Okay? This is our L. We ignore the entrance, we ignore the exit. Just look at this layer. Going back to this equation, uh, to this question, now do we have Vx within this red layer? Is there any Vx? No. So now Vx is zero, only in our system. Vy is zero as well, right? It does not go this way, so there's no Vy. It does not go this way, there's no Vx, okay? About Vx, you have to imagine, if I have Vx, that's supposed to be velocity pulling the profile to go down like this. If it goes down, it hits the wall, right? When it hits the wall, where does it go? Going back. If it goes like this, can it still be laminar? No. So if our system consider only laminar flow, there's no way to get Vx. Okay? So now, once we set up, Vx is zero, Vy is zero, Vz is zero. Then we can move on. Do you understand this? Understanding is one part. Can you do it by yourself? That's another story. A bit of a tip for you, okay? Within the course, within this course, normally, normally, when, when we are kind, and this is normal, when we are kind, only one velocity component is not zero. The rest is usually zero. So your job is just finding which one is not zero. Okay? So the first task is set up equation, I'm sorry, set up system, set up coordinates, set up the axis. Second task, asking yourself which component are zero. Third, ask again, the one that is not zero is a function of what? So VZ, supposed to be a function of position. Which one is a function? I mean, Vz depends on which variable. Ask yourself, do we have Vz changing with respect to x? If Vz is changing with respect to x, that means along x-axis, Vc here should change. Or draw a line in x direction. Use your finger going down here. And ask yourself as your finger is going down, do you experience different velocity? Or find two points within this line that there are different velocity. Can you find two points in this line that have different velocity? The trick is you need to look at the interface. The interface in this picture is here and there. Do you think velocity at these two points are the same? Remember what we discussed from very first class. 
No, the second class, no sleep condition. What does it mean, no sleep condition? At solid liquid interface, velocity of liquid should equal to velocity of solid. This interface is solid liquid interface, right? Velocity of liquid here must be equal to velocity of solid, which is zero. So at this point, Vz is zero under no slip condition. At this point, Vz is not zero. Of course, flow, liquid is flowing. So velocity here is not zero. So along this red line in x direction, at least there are two points that are not the same in terms of velocity. OK? So that means right now, my Vz is at least function of x. It is function of x for sure. Is Vz is function of y? Now you have to go in y direction, asking yourself, velocity here, there, does it change with respect to y? If there, is, there are walls in here and in here, if there are walls, then at the wall, velocity is 0 under no slip condition. At the center, velocity is not. Then Vz is function of y, OK, if you have a wall. But in this picture, there is no wall. Water is flowing down on the plane only. There's no wall on the side. If we consider only this part, where this is the system that we consider, there's no spillover to the right and to the left. In that case, we can assume that we see around here and there are uniform. OK? So we will say that Vz is not function of y. Is Vz a function of z? Of course, if you consider the whole system, there will be acceleration, then Vz is changing with respect to z. The longer the z, the greater the velocity because of the acceleration of gravity. But now we consider only the short part to avoid this problem. Within this short part, we can say that acceleration is negligible. If it is negligible, Vz does not change with respect to z. OK? So right now, we only have Vc, which is not 0, and it is function of x only. OK? Now, if Vx is 0, it means that x momentum is supposed to be 0. There is no velocity in x direction, so therefore there should be no x momentum. Vy is 0. That means y momentum is supposed to be 0. Vz is not 0. That means z momentum is not 0. This is what we want, or this is what we have to calculate. OK? 
Z momentum supposed to have three members. This is combined flux. The combined flux associated with Z momentum supposed to have the second subscript to be Z. Okay? So have XZ. So this is Z momentum transferring in X direction. Z momentum transferring in Y direction and Z momentum transferring in Z direction. Okay? So within this system, we will consider only three components. Now, let us imagine the system, okay? As I said from very first class, in transport phenomena, we allow changes within the system. That means velocity within the system doesn't have to be uniform. Temperature within the system does not have to be uniform, like in thermodynamics. It can change with respect to position. So in order to do that, or do the calculation, normally we will consider only small part within the system first. Set up a balance around that small system and then integrate it or move that small system to cover the whole large system. Okay? That small system like if I put a small system over here, I do a balance around there, set up an equation. If I move this small system around the whole large system to cover them all, then I can, it means that I'm integrating the equation. And then I will get the result. All right? This small system is called shell. Okay? So your job, in this chapter, we are in chapter 2. This is 2.1. Your job is to imagine what does the shell look like. You have to imagine the shape of the shell. Okay? If you come up with the wrong shape of the shell, you can end up two ways. First, the equation is too complicated, you cannot solve. Second, you can solve, but everything will be wrong. Okay? So it is really important to come up with the correct shape of the shell. Here's the rules. Within the shell, velocity must be the same. So every point within the shell, they share the same velocity. That, is mean, that means your shell will travel as a piece of solid. Within the solid, every point in the solid travel with the same speed, right? So you have to imagine a shell as a solid piece traveling with the same speed. Okay, that's the rules. Then, it is easier to follow the next rules. The shell here must have at least one side to be really thin. Okay? For instance, if I draw this small shell, I enlarge the picture. If this is X, this is Z. Small shell like this, if the whole system going this way, should have distance here or sides here to be delta x or dx, very small. This size to be delta z or dz, again, very small. Velocity, every point within the shell would be the same as if the whole shell becomes solid. Okay? 
So at least one side of your shell must be thin, must be delta. If you put two sides to be delta, the equation would be twice as hard. We want delta to be only one side, actually. It would be easier to have thin side to be limited to only one side. Okay? The rule is, normally, it depends on this, on velocity. If velocity is changing in one particular direction, the shell in that direction must be thin. Again, if your velocity is changing in this direction, x direction, that means shell in x direction must be thin. So your shell at least should have dimension of delta x on the x direction. The rest, the rest, where y and z is not, I mean v, vz is not function of y and z, the other direction can be full size. Full size, what does it mean? You have y and z, right? vz is not function of y, it's not function of z. So that means the shell in y direction can span over the whole system. In y direction, the whole system has the size of v, w. So the shell can have the length of w or the width of w because it is not function of y. It is not function of z, therefore your shell can expand to the length of L. Okay? So from this, you can say that your shell supposed to be a box with dimension delta x, w, L. What does it look like? It's not like this anymore. Three-dimensionally, it looks like this. This is W, this is L, and the thickness over here is only delta X. So the shell is a flat plate, thin plate. This plate is supposed to have supposed to look like this. Distance here is delta x. It covers the whole length of L. It covers the whole length of W. Okay? This whole flat plate goes together as a solid plate. This is extremely important in this chapter. In order to get this right, you have to analyze this correctly. Understand? Hopefully you can do it on your own. The step is basically analyzing velocity components, finding the one that is non-zero, and then ask yourself whether the non-zero component is a function of what? Function of x, y, and z. Then, only the one that is function, in this case, is function of x only, the shell in that side is supposed to be thin. The shell in the rest of the direction expand to the full length of your system. Okay? Now, we will link to this momentum. Now we have xz, yz, zz. 
let us put it in the shell. Dimension looks like this. This is x, this is y, and z. Okay? xz is z momentum transferring in x direction. And x direction is going down. Down this way. Not this way, okay? Down this way. So I have direction of the transfer, which is double arrow, going along x direction. So this is xz going down, going in, and going out. If you look into the, this picture is going this way. This is phi xz. going perpendicular to the shell, going in and going out. All right? The position of the shell, the upper layer, the upper position here, occurs at any x because you can move the shell up and down. So this position can be any x. This position underneath here is basically x plus the thickness of the shell itself. So it is x plus delta x, because the thickness of the shell is delta x. OK? So whatever comes in, comes in at position of x. It goes out at x plus delta x. That's the first one, xz. Second one is yz. It's z momentum transferring in y direction. So the direction of transfer going in y direction like this. Let me erase this. So this is yz going in at y equal to 0. y equal to 0 is here. Going out at y equal to w. Transferring. Remember, I use double arrow for the direction of transfer. Transferring here, going out there. The third one is ZZ. It's Z momentum transferring in Z direction. Direction of the transfer going in, going out, along Z direction. In, it's at Z equal to 0. Out, at Z equal to L. OK? At this stage, Please set up direction of the transfer along direction of your axis. If you put axis pointing this way, put the direction of the transfer along the axis. You don't have to worry about the flow. As long as you pick one axis going along the flow, you are fine. But I, I can show you later. It doesn't matter. Even you point direction against the flow, and you put direction along the, the direction of the axis, still you are fine. So don't be confused. Set up an axis, and then all the direction follow the axis. OK? We have 15 minutes left, 10 minutes actually. Now we will try to see how we represent this one. Phi xz, phi yz, 
and VZZ. According to our definition from the beginning of this class, phi xz is tau xz plus rho vx vz. Okay? Remember, this is just a component in a tensor. So right now, this one, if you write like this, it is scalar. Okay? yz equal to tau yz plus rho vy vz. If it is scalar, you can write x first or write z first. Doesn't matter. OK? From the very beginning of the class, I said, I said like this. This is vx vz. This is x momentum transferring in z direction if I write this way. But you can flip. If you take parentheses out, it can be z momentum transferred in x direction as well. It doesn't matter because this one is scalar. Okay, so don't be confused. It would be easier to just follow the subscript. xx, you have xx all the way. xz, you have xz all the way. For ZZ, you have tau ZZ, rho VZ, VZ. And whenever you have same subscript, you need to add pressure. Pressure acts only on the normal direction. That means whenever you have the same subscript. Let us imagine that pressure is in Z direction for the moment. Actually, pressure has no direction, OK? Now, according to this, we analyzed velocity component already. Vx is 0, Vy is 0, Vz is not. So we can neglect. Convective transport in x direction, convective transport of z momentum in y direction right away, simply because vx and vy are 0. All right? Then you need Newton's law, Newton's law that we learned from second class. Tau xz is equal to minus mu dvz by dx plus dvx by dz. That's Newton's law for rectangular coordinate. Tau yz is minus mu dvz by dy plus dvy by dz. And you don't have to worry about remembering all this. The equation will be given in examination. Actually, examination is open book anyway. OK? For tau zz, that's minus mu 2 of dvz by dz plus 2 third mu minus k del dot v. But the normal stress is a little bit longer. OK? Your job, write down all the equations, then find out which component or which components are 0. For instance, Vx here is 0. Vy here is 0, right? And we know that, I told you that, for incompressible fluid or for liquid, del dot V is 0. This will be proven in chapter 3. Okay, But at this moment, just take my word. Whenever you have liquid, 
this term is 0. What else are 0? Vc is not 0, OK? But Vc itself is not function of y. Here, Vc is not function of y. So therefore, differentiation Vc with respect to y is 0. OK, this is partial differentiation with respect to y. If Vc is not function of y, when you differentiate this one, you take this as a constant. So differentiation gives you 0. Vc is not function of z. According to this, we neglect acceleration. So therefore, Vc over z here is 0. Vc is function of x. So this term is not 0. OK? Now, if you plug this equation back here, you will see that this term is minus mu dvz by dx. This term is already 0 because it is 0 here, 0 there. This term is 0. This term is 0. This term is 0. Both of them are 0. So here is 0. This is not 0. Pressure is not 0. So all the blue terms are there. So I should write this one in blue minus mu. OK? And this, I can say that because Vz is a function of x only, so it doesn't have to be partial differentiation anymore. I can say that it is total differentiation. It is function of x only. We can change from partial differentiation to total differentiation. And that would keep your life. I mean, that would make your life much, much easier. All right? I will stop here. And we have to continue next time. Any question? So as for today, what we do, what we did learn, is a combination of the flux molecular flux, convective flux together, and you have to add pressure, OK? So the combined flux phi contains three terms, tau, rho vv, and pressure for, one, for some particular directions. Then we put them together into equation of balance called momentum balance. Momentum rate of momentum in subtracted by r equal to uh, plus force equal to 0 at steady state. And then example, OK? For examples, you need to set up equation, set up axis, pick up coordinate first. That's your first task. Second task, identify velocity component, which are 0, which are not. Then ask yourself the non-zero components is a function of what? That would determine the shape of your shell, OK? We will continue on next week, Tuesday. All right, if you have questions, come up and ask. Otherwise, see you Tuesday.